Symposium. I'd also like to acknowledge the Honorable Lily D'Ambrosio, the Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change, and the Minister for Solar Homes for the Victorian Government, and she'll be joining us shortly. A big welcome to all of you attendees on representing industry, research institutions and academia from both Germany and Australia. And I'd like to thank everybody who worked really hard to make this symposium happen. I know these things don't happen by chance. And to the University of Melbourne for hosting us this morning. And I must admit, I had a lovely tour of the University of Melbourne this morning while I was trying to find the old quad building. It's a lovely campus. So energy, a hot topic indeed in both countries. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing about Germany's energy experiences. Australia and Germany have much to learn from each other as both countries traverse the energy transition. I'm particularly interested to learn about any Germany's experiences with the integration of renewable energy into their grid. Germany crossed a symbolic milestone earlier this year by briefly covering around about 100% of electricity use for, with renewables for the first time. This year, Chancellor Angela Merkel announced Germany would withdraw from coal-fired power production by 2038. I'm going to be very interested to learn Germany's plan to do this in an orderly way as Australia faces the exit of its older coal fleet in the coming years. Australia's power system, like that of Germany and other major economies, is undergoing a transition to a much more diverse and distributed energy mix. And this clearly presents a lot of challenges for us all. Australia's coal-fired electricity generation fleet is aging and the economics of coal generation is being challenged by the increasing penetration of renewables. Coal and natural gas produced over 80% of our total energy production in the NEM in 2018. That's the national energy market. But renewables make up about 20% and they're growing with wind and solar connecting to the grid. We're also in Australia facing rising energy prices for electricity, which have doubled in the last decade. Wholesale spot prices have reached record highs and gas prices have risen on the back of Australia's liquefied natural gas export industry. While wholesale are, prices are high, we've recently seen an increase in the number of low and recently negative price periods during the middle of the day when there's much more solar output. So clearly a lot of challenges on a lot of fronts. But we're responding to these challenges and opportunities in a range of different ways. Our focus is on maintaining security, reliability, and lowering prices for households and businesses while meeting our emissions reductions commitments. We're investing in new generation, transmission, and infrastructure while also undertaking quite significant market reforms to enhance, mar to enhance competition. On clean energy investment, we've reached a record high 13 billion in 2018, ranking our investment in clean energy as some of the highest per capita in the world. Around 20% of Australian households now have so rooftop solar. By 2050, it's forecast that Australia will have among the highest renewable penetration and the most decentralized power system in the world. That's quite a challenge and that's quite an opportunity. So the Australian government is implementing a number of energy poli policy measures. On July 1, we introduced a retailer reliability obligation. It works by incentivizing retailers and large users to contract or invest in dispatchable and on-demand resources. It will only be triggered if the Australian energy market operator forecasts a gap three years and three months out. We're also underwriting new generation investments, which creates an ongoing mechanism to support targeted investment that will lower prices, increase competition, and increase reliability in the energy system. Thirdly, we're investing in electricity storage and transmission infrastructure, including through Snowy 2.0, a pumped hydro project that will provide an additional 2,000 megawatts of generation capacity and 350,000 megawatts of energy storage, enough to power 500,000 homes. Snowy 2.0 is anticipated to begin dispatching and storing power by 2025. On electricity transmission, the Australian and Tasmanian governments are working towards a second Bass Strait interconnector known as Marinus Link, which will assist in firming renewable generation capacity. And finally, in electricity, the Australian government is undertaking market reforms in the electricity sector. We've introduced a default market offer, which acts as a price cap on the amount electricity retailers can charge customers on standing offers in certain jurisdictions. We've also committed to introducing new legislation that will seek to penalize both retail and generation businesses if they behave in an anti-competitive way. This is known fondly as the big stick legislation. A few of you might have read about that today. We're also considering ways to increase domestic supply of natural gas and put downward pressure on prices. 
Australia and our position, position as a leading natural gas exporter is making an important contribution to regional and global energy security and to emissions reduction. Liquid fuel security is also a very important issue for Australia. A liquid fuel security review is being prepared which looks at energy security and different possible energy futures and the impacts of potential disruption events. And certainly events of this week highlight the importance of this review. In terms of emerging technologies and innovations, hydrogen has a key role to play in an economically, socially and environmentally sustainable future. You might be aware that Australia is developing a natural hydrogen strategy in 2019 with the goal of building a hydrogen industry here in Australia and to position us as a major exporter by 2030. We are seeking to develop new low carbon industries and trade relationships with trading partners and major economies like Germany while helping to reduce global emissions. We would certainly like to explore the potential for deeper engagement with Germany to build on building the hydrogen economy, including through bilateral agreements. We've already invested over $100 million in supporting hydrogen projects, including a supply, plane, supply train trial, that's a really hard thing to say, to produce hydrogen in the Latrobe Valley here in Victoria and to export it to Japan. Hydrogen is one area where opportunities for collaboration are really plentiful for discussions over the, next, over the coming days, and there is a dedicated session tomorrow. <clears throat> but we must also explore collaborations in other low emissions technologies. We support a technology neutral approach to reducing emissions, and we see a role for all low emission technologies. We're investing significant capital in this area that could be partnered with German capital. For example, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation is investing $10 billion in clean energy products and low emissions technologies. This makes the CEFC one of the world's largest green banks. A key part of the energy transition is certainly energy efficiency and energy productivity. The Australian government target is to, in, to improve energy productivity by 40% by 2030. To meet this target, the Australian Government is implementing a range of measures under the National, Environmental, National Energy Productivity Plan, most notably in the commercial and residential building sectors. It's valuable to recognise that energy efficiency is certainly an important contributor in Australia meeting and beating our emissions reduction commitments. Demand response is also an integral part when it comes to energy efficiency. The Australian Energy Market Commission has recently released proposals on changes to its wholesale demand response mechanism. This will open up the wholesale electricity market so large consumers can be more easily paid for reducing their demand on the power system. But we have much that we can learn in this area from the Germans in terms of energy efficiency and energy productivity. I'd like to briefly touch on the importance of international collaboration between our two countries. We're very much like-minded on many issues that relate to our national interests in the international energy institutions. This includes our mutual interest in ensuring good governance and our mutual interest in energy security while advancing the transition to a low carbon energy system globally. Australia and Germany are also working together within the National Energy Agency. This collaboration includes taking positions to advance modernization of the IEA. We want to make sure that the institution is inclusive and that energy security measures remain effective both now and into the future. So in closing, although Australia and Germany, although regionally worlds apart, as you would have experienced on a very long flight, we're very long-minded, like-minded international players and we share many common interests. Our context may vary, but our issues are very similar. I really look forward to our discussions today and tomorrow and to the dialogue during the sessions and during the breaks. I'd like to thank you all again for coming today and I would now like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Uh, Falk Bumecki, head of the German delegation, to take the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this comes a little bit unexpected because um, my director general uh, will address you by video message, but I use this opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Falk Böhmecke. I'm the deputy head of international cooperation division um, of my ministry, which is called um, Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. And thank you very much, Rachel. Um, for your introduction um, and for your kind words about Germany. Um, and we are looking forward to three days of very intense um, discussions and cooperation and possibilities. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. 
Um, but I, I leave it with this, um, and I turn over to Director General Torsten Herdern, who wanted to be here with you, and I think he's the most, imp uh, most disappointed person that he can't, but we have uh, very intense discussions this week in Germany about energy policy. Um, uh, on Friday, we have the so-called Climate Cabinet, which is chaired by our Chancellor, Angela Merkel, and we will make decisions on our way forward to 2030 um, and how to meet our energy and climate goals. And for that reason, uh, since discussions are, seem to go on until the very last minute how to actually implement um, all the measures to reach these goals, uh, the Director General unfortunately had to stay in Germany and advise the Minister how to go forward, and that's why he will now address you by video message. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister Ambrosio, dear Ms. Perry, I sincerely would like to thank you for this Australian-German Energy Symposium for the first time. And I'm really very, very concerned that I was not able to join you today. I would really have liked to come down to Down Under. But uh, we have uh, in this week very important debates uh, on climate climate uh, issues and uh, we will this week on Friday decide within our climate cabinet on the way further till 2030. And this is something for Germany which is not only very important for Germany itself but I think it is something which is also very important for Europe and I think also for the rest of Europe since we have been known and are still known as the country of the energy transition. We as you know um, are very fast in energy transition if it comes to the electricity sector. In the electricity sector, we have made a lot of progress. We have reached the 40% renewables share in our electricity sector, and we will continue to grow that to 65% by 2030. But on the other hand, we are lacking and we are falling behind in the very important sectors like transport, like buildings or industry. And that is why we have set a climate cabinet together, which will decide on the whole broad range of measures and of tasks for all the sectors involved in climate and in energy. That is why our ministers of transport, of economic affairs, of energy, of environment, and also of buildings uh, and industry will decide this Friday on the way into the future. And that is why I'm very sorry I cannot join you, but I like to open this Australian-German Energy Symposium by this video message. At least this is something I can do. By this, I also promise you that uh, I will join you next time uh, in Australia, in Down Under. We will certainly find many, many more ways to discuss all together our partnership and to seek uh, what can we learn from each other. That also means that I would like to thank the Department of Energy and Environment as well as the University for organizing this event. My people will help you to not only talk about lessons learned, but also to talk about the way forward. The way forward we can go together. The way forward we can go, everybody from us, in terms of what we have learned from each other. And also, my dear colleague, the president of our regulator, Jochen Hohmann, will be with you in order to demonstrate you a little bit what could be done in the regulatory framework if it comes to electrical grids, but if it comes to energy infrastructure. For us, energy infrastructure is very important. It's the backbone for all energy transition. And it's not only the electric grid. The electric grid, we thought some decades ago, can only afford, let's say, up to 10% of renewables. Today we are, as I said, at 40% renewables and our grid is completely safe. We have only 12 minutes, not a day, not a month, but a year of supply interruption in the electric grid. And that proves that we can afford a lot of renewable energy in the grid without putting it on an unsafe um, situation. But it's not only the electric grid, it's also the gas grid. 
which is very important for us gas accounts in Germany, in Europe, but also in other countries to a large amount of energy supplied, specifically in the sectors of buildings or industry or even transport perhaps in the future. And that is what brings me to a very important point of our collaboration, which is hydrogen. We all know that hydrogen has a big potential for the future to not only help to improve climate, but also to help to increase industrial workload, to help to increase welfare, because we believe uh, that with local production of hydrogen made out of renewable energy, we will have a big opportunity to add to the energy, energy transition, which we know as so far. That is why we as the German government have agreed and decided to prepare a hydrogen strategy. And that is, with, your all, with, with all your experiences on hydrogen, what gives us a very good possibility for cooperation in the future. But it's not only hydrogen, I think it's all the parts of energy, and it's all the question on how we can look at energy on a system approach. That means not only bringing the sectors like building, industry, transport, and electricity to get together, but it also means to bring the infrastructure together and, of course, to bring countries together and to see what can we do also in the trade business, perhaps years later. So up to now, it's very clear where the energy flows are traded from countries to other countries. That may change and will change completely. Renewables will provide for a big portion of possibilities to not only transport um, liquid gas or natural gas from one country to the other, but perhaps then from hydrogen to one country to the other. And what you have agreed to do with Japan, for, in for instance, may be something we could also agree to do between Australia and Europe at some point of time. That are only a few issues which uh, you are what you are going to discuss in the next days to come. I wish you all the best for that. Again, I'm really sorry uh, not being with you today, but I wish you all the best. And again, I'm promised to be with you next time in Down Under. All the best and see you next time in Australia. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Herdan. It's uh, great to have his video message and a great shame he couldn't be here with us. Thank you also, Rachel and, um, and Feld, for introducing yourselves. Um, this day is hosted by DOEE on the Australian side and by BMWI on the German side. And it's, um, it's fantastic to, to have that um, support and hosting. And it's been great working with both ministries in the, in the weeks preceding the event. Um, it's been uh, a good example of collaboration and action and um, over the last two years we've really had insight into uh, how rich some of the learnings are from both countries and um, how important that collaborative effort is. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce the Honourable Minister D'Ambrosio from Victoria, the Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change and the Minister for Solar Homes. Um, Victoria, together with other, all of the other states and territories in Australia, um, has very ambitious climate um, emission reductions targets. Um, in Victoria, we have a target of net zero by 2050, uh, and it's um, playing a leading role in developing policies and initiatives towards achieving those targets. Um, so it's fantastic to have the minister here today. I welcome you to the stage. Thank you. Good morning to all of you, uh, and thank you for the welcome. Uh, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting here today. And my respects uh, go to them, their elders past and present uh, and uh, emerging, and any who may be here amongst us today. And of course to Rachel Parry, uh, First Assistant Secretary for Energy Australian Department of the Environment and Energy, to Falka uh, Bonnecke, Councillor, German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, and to all of you, uh, thank you again. Uh, I'm very excited to have uh, received an invitation to join with you here this morning, and, and uh, I, I must note, because I promised I would, that walking into this uh, beautiful, beautifully read 
reimagined re uh, building uh, is actually got, uh, in, had installed, I think, triple glazing <laughs> from Germany. So energy efficiency certainly is alive and well. Uh, and uh, I think that's important for us to understand that there are so many efforts across the spectrum of energy uh, where a lot of effort is being uh, had, if you like, to meet uh, the significant challenges that we have in terms of reducing carbon emissions. Uh, of course, in Victoria, like other states and countries, uh, there are significant changes, of course, uh, across the energy landscape worldwide. And we are certainly seeing this transformation impact all players in the energy sector. Those, of course, who generate or produce electricity, uh, those who are researching and developing new technology, and, of course, consumers who are producing their own power or wanting to cut their bills. Uh, and that all uh, comes together into a global effort. But also we know industry uh, are also embracing opportunities to build a direct relationship with energy producers. Uh, we need to, of course, to fully explore the opportunities created by this change and be prepared to meet the challenges if we are to build a cleaner energy future. Uh, and I'm reminded uh, really very much at a grassroots level uh, how consumers have really made up their mind on this. Uh, they've made up their mind uh, to seek uh, cleaner forms of energy, to seek more affordable forms of energy, uh, and any uh, debates around whether that's a good thing or a bad thing I think are well, well beyond that point. Uh, and all of us, all institutions, need to embrace uh, the opportunities and where people want to take us. Uh, and so, now more than ever, we need progressive, ambitious and strategic policies to deliver a transformed energy sector. Governments play certainly a key role in this and the transition cannot be made without government leadership and effective energy market rules. And certainly, and I'm confident this is the case uh, for many countries, is that certainly in Australia and Victoria in particular, uh, it was governments that established the energy sector. Uh, without government support, uh, Victoria, for example, would not have developed into the manufacturing hub of our country, albeit uh, having used uh, fossil fuels uh, to develop and underpin the success of our economy for many, many decades. As the Victorian Energy Minister, I'm very much focused on delivering Victoria's vision for affordable, sustainable and reliable energy system. Our government's goals are very clear. Uh, invest to find the opportunities and tackle the challenges presented by a changing climate, provide a secure and sustainable future for our energy industry and keep costs down now for community and businesses. That's going to be always an important part of uh, our challenge. But there are opportunities there, of course, too. Uh, this cannot be delivered in isolation. We need all parts of the energy sector and industry to play a far greater role in delivering the next wave of infrastructure investment and market reform. The rules of our energy market in Australia were set almost 20 years ago, well before we understood the challenges or the opportunities of a clean energy future. Those market settings, those market rules are very inflexible and certainly are not up to the task of delivering uh, very much uh, what we have now and very dynamic uh, change or push for change that we need to embrace. The challenge we're facing now, of course, as I said, is the rules were established as a set and forget. Don't worry about it. We've got it now. We've got our national energy market and we can get on with other business. These rules are out of date and we need institutions that are ready, willing and able to meet the needs of a 21st century energy system. And that means that we need to turn around rules changes uh, more rapidly than what it seems to be the current um, consideration for the need for change. Victoria certainly has been very clear uh, in our ambitions for renewable energy. We uh, are noted for having legislated for our initial targets, 25% uh, renewable energy generation by 2020, 40% uh, by 2025, and we have legislation in the parliament right now uh, to take our aspiration or our ambition and our commitment to 50% uh, by 2030. Our 2025 target alone is expected to create more than 10,000 construction jobs, 
mostly in regional Victoria, and generate annual electricity bill savings of around $30 for households on average, $2,500 for medium businesses, and $140,000 for large companies. These are figures that perhaps, uh, in terms of the cost uh, and the, the benefits of uh, cheaper power, uh, sometimes uh, gets bypassed in conversations, but governments cannot afford to bypass any of these. It's very important uh, if we are to keep social licence for where we need to take us in terms of uh, the reforms. In addition, uh, in 2017, uh, our state held the Victorian Renewable Energy Reverse Auction. Well, that is right now supporting six projects with the capacity to produce enough electricity to power more than 645,000 Victorian homes. This was the single largest reverse auction held in this country even today. These projects will contribute more than $1.1 billion to the state and create more than 900 jobs. As a direct result of our targets, we've seen a strong renewable energy supply chain emerge in our state. And that is because we required certain conditions to be met as part of our auction for local content. We're the only state that's done that for renewable energy. And the results are starting to be seen. Uh, we have Vestas Turbine Assembly breathing new life into Geelong's old Ford factory. Many of you will know about that story. Keppel Prince is producing a record number of wind towers uh, in regional Victoria. And companies such as Wilson's Transformers uh, are expanding their capacity. So businesses such as these sit at the heart of Victoria's clean energy economy. We always said from the beginning that our ambition wasn't just to build more megawatts of clean power, but was also to develop up an industry. And that's what our commitment includes. However, of course, these long-term investments can't occur without certainty and ongoing ambitious leadership. In addition to our renewable energy targets, we've introduced Victoria's Climate Change Act. This is part of a centrepiece of our commitment to minimise the impacts of climate change. Uh, and certainly, uh, there was mentioned earlier in the introductions uh, of our legislative commitment to uh, achieve net zero emissions uh, target uh, by 2050. But we've also uh, committed in legislation to establish interim emissions reduction targets on five yearly tranches, if you like. Because one thing is for sure is that we need to see movement sooner, improvement sooner rather than later. Uh, and, of course, uh, we are due to establish what those interim emissions targets uh, will be for 2025 and 2030. Uh, very soon, that will be in the first half of next year. They, those targets uh, will be accompanied by sector pledges underpinned by practical, concrete actions. This is as much a signal to uh, industry about where we want to go uh, not just where we want to arrive finally, but how we intend to get to that destination and the stops along the way. To inform this process, our government established an independent expert committee to provide advice on what the appropriate targets ought to be for 25 and 2030. This independent expert panel has provided its report to government, recommending interim emissions reduction targets of a range of between 45 and 60% by 2030, on 2005 levels. Now, I know that some of you here have been part of uh, those uh, conversations and formulating uh, submissions uh, to that uh, expert panel. The panel's report clearly shows that the benefits of taking action to reduce emissions far outweighs the costs. And action on climate change will attract investment, create jobs, and drive down power prices. This is something we should never forget as we discuss the challenges of climate change. Early action brings significant economic benefits for our state and we intend uh, to uh, attract those early, uh, those economic benefits. We need the right approach for the Victorian community and economy, but we also wanna play our part in global efforts to reduce the dangerous impacts of climate change. To set lower targets will only delay Victoria's opportunity to realise the economic benefits from taking strong action on climate change. Benefits such as a more competitive economy, new jobs and investment opportunities in emerging low carbon industries. 
modelling commissioned by the panel also found that its recommended targets chart a more cost-effective pathway to net zero emissions in 2050 than targets that delay substantial emissions reductions until after 2030. Of course, plainly, it is more expensive to delay action than to act now. So, as I mentioned, uh, we are deliberating on uh, those recommendations and will be setting the targets uh, by the middle of next year. So as we work with different sectors to cut uh, emissions, we are investing in research and pilot projects to trial new energy sources and technology, and in particular hydrogen. This certainly is an area where Germany has already achieved a number of advancements and is leading the world in research into new applications for hydrogen, as well as commercial style, scale production. Victoria absolutely can learn much from Germany's progress in these areas, where we are still at pilot stage such as gas blending and injection and distribution pipelines, both areas of significant interest given Victoria's extensive gas network and our strong commitment to achieving net zero emissions. Some of you perhaps as uh, interstate uh, overseas uh, visitors uh, uh, may not know that uh, Victoria's gas network, uh, distribution network is the most um, significant, if you like, ubiquitous uh, of all of the states. So this is certainly an area of interest to us, but it's one area. There are many opportunities for us to share knowledge to help drive forward a global transition to green hydrogen production. Although we may be at an earlier stage of research and testing for applications and uses of green hydrogen, Victoria has already made some important steps. We're capturing the benefits of a green hydrogen economy through the Victorian Hydrogen Investment Programme. Through this program, we have set out a clear pathway to develop the hydrogen sector in Victoria across three activity streams, market testing, industry development and investment. We are consulting with stakeholders and industry to determine interest in a green hydrogen market, identify opportunities and understand the sector's primary drivers, barriers and capabilities. By supporting the green hydrogen industry to flourish in Victoria, we will not only be helping meet the electricity industry's emissions reduction targets, but also those of sectors such as transport and gas. There is already significant expertise and a significant body of work here in Victoria. We'll be looking to leverage hydrogen research, trials, pilots and demonstrations, creating a strong base of industry knowledge, skills and seed funding. At a national level, Victoria is part of setting the framework for an Australia-wide hydrogen industry. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to report that I met uh, just a couple of days ago uh, with Dr Alan Finkel, of course, Australia's lead uh, scientist, who is undertaking this work on behalf of all of the jurisdictions at a national level. He will be producing a framework to promote a clean, innovative and competitive hydrogen industry and position Australia as a ma major global player by 2030. We will be, as a state, consulting extensively with industry, hydrogen experts and community stakeholders across key areas such as opportunities to attract hydrogen investment, opportunities for green hydrogen production, developing a hydrogen export industry, understanding how hydrogen can support electricity systems and gas networks. So we've already received a strong response from our stakeholders and communities, which has highlighted the significant potential for green hydrogen and its importance for Victoria. Very soon, uh, I will be releasing a discussion paper, which will then take us to the next steps of us developing our strategy. Now, we've also been very clear as a state that the shift to clean energy needs to deliver for all consumers and leave nobody behind. In Victoria, we are delivering this through several programs and initiatives. For example, we have a, a, an Australia leading program, Solar Homes Program. That is a $1.3 billion program which will support 770,000 households to install solar power, a battery or solar hot water uh, in their homes over the next 10 years. This is more than two gigawatts of new power on people's roofs. It's a significant amount of additional power. It'll boost the number of Victorian homes with solar panels to one million and will save Victorians more than $500 million a year, collectively, of course, on their electricity bills once the program is complete. 
Another example of our government effort is a $16 million microgrid demonstration initiative, which showcases innovative projects that combine renewable energy, storage and smart control technologies. This includes the totally renewable Yakandandas microgrid demonstration, Origin Energy's virtual power plant and the Euroa Environment Group's community microgrid. These projects have already received funding and they are being built right now. So it's very exciting uh, and I'm very keen to see the outcomes of these projects. This rapid uptake of distributed behind the metre resources will require new regulation and infrastructure planning. Maximising our distributed energy resource opportunities will require technologies to ensure the visibility, control and coordination, particularly for the market operator who uh, is going from uh, if you like, conducting an orchestra of 100 pieces to an orchestra of 1,000 pieces, if, if you think about uh, the complexity of our energy system and how it's only going to become more complex. Uh, Maximising the distributed energy resource opportunities will also require incentives and protection for consumers and establishing and reforming marketplaces for grid services to be bought and sold. These innovative technologies need a market, they need to have a value in a formal market. And that is one area that sadly our rules are very lacking in. That's why uh, as a state we're investing $10 million to maximise the benefits of renewable resources for the community and build the grid of the future. As part of this, we will deliver a distributed energy resources strategy to drive vital regulatory reform and identify opportunities to benefit all consumers, not just those who have invested in DER. To successfully navigate this transmission, it's also crucial to effectively manage reliability. It is unforgiving for any governments uh, not to, uh, not to uh, address that really important issue. Having invested in cleaner, better energy options at home, the public rightly expects that when they flick a switch, things turn on. Increased transmission interconnection across the national electricity market is critical for supporting reliability. These transmission needs have been identified by the Australian Energy Market Operator in its integrated system plan, but work remains on the implementation of that plan. This is, I suppose, another example of the slowness of our institutions uh, and certainly uh, governments across uh, the national energy market uh, need to take a level of responsibility for that. Transmission planning frameworks need to allow greater consideration of the risk mitigation value of ISP transmission projects, particularly the benefits of maintaining system resilience in the face of potential unexpected supply shocks. In Victoria, we're increasing our reliability through uh, a number of projects, including uh, a $25 million investment in our energy storage initiative, which is helping right now to stabilise the grid and providing backup power if required. The first of the two batteries, and that's the storage uh, technology that uh, this money went towards, d the first of the two batteries delivered a 50 megawatt hour battery co-located with the Gunawara solar farm. The second delivered a 30 megawatt hour battery at the Ballarat terminal station. Both batteries are strategically located and deliver crucial frequency control and backup services in milliseconds to maintain stability in the network for Western Victoria. A third battery, uh, which also has our government support, is being built at the Bulgana Green Power Hub. This 34 megawatt hour battery is co-located with a 194 megawatt wind farm and state-of-the-art agricultural facility. The battery will power the agricultural facility uh, and also operate in the market to further increase network reliability. So, certainly we find ourselves uh, Part in, in part of a significant global shift in how we generate, distribute and consume energy. That is unquestionable. But we must coordinate efforts through government leadership and collaboration with industry, researchers and communities. There is still a long way to go for us to be comfortable enough to know that we've achieved a, the, the right level of coordinated effort. And we need to find and harness the opportunities to collaborate across our different areas of responsibility and expertise, sharing our lessons and working together on new solutions. So thank you very much for indulging me with um, 
a somewhat lengthy contribution, but I think it was very important to touch on all of the aspects of our government's commitments uh, in terms of uh, our thinking, our plans to manage this energy transition and to demonstrate the level of amb ambition that we are actually applying to the efforts that uh, we're backing uh, thus far. So I certainly hope that uh, you have a, a most enjoyable and informative symposium and I look forward to the other opportunities uh, that uh, uh, allow themselves uh, to be made for all of us to have further engagements uh, over the while uh, through the various areas of expertise that uh, you hold uh, so that we can actually uh, end up with a, a transition that is well managed, well planned for, um, produces the best economic outcomes uh, and absolutely takes consumers uh, with us. All of those are an important part, uh, ingredients, if you like, of a, of a very successful transition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister D'Ambrosio. Um, it's wonderful to have you here to traverse all of the um, initiatives that are being pursued in Victoria and many of the issues that are being faced. I think it's um, absolutely clear having the Minister speak following um, Rachel from the Department of the Environment and Energy um, and Thorsten that these initiatives are being pursued at a myriad of levels in Australia, um, at the federal, the state and even at local government levels and that there are um, a range of tools being brought to uh, um, address the energy transition. Um, and um, of course that's also very clear from um, Mr Heran's statement and I think um, it's a, a great framing for many of the issues that we will be working through in the next, uh, in more detail in the next three days. Um, uh, so we would, I think, like now to run through some of the housekeeping um, issues. There's quite a number. I'll try not to make this the longest discussion of the day. Um, but I would like to start by um, acknowledging again what a fantastic group of people we have in the room today. Um, I do hope that you will uh, get an opportunity to meet many people that you do not already know. Um, that is usually easier when, of course, we have people from two countries because um, it's not the same group of faces. We have roughly equal numbers from industry, government and research here and also um, members from NGOs and other civil society groups um, and the unions. Um, it's great to have everybody gathered here today. Um, it might be a good moment for you to meet someone on either side and um, pause just to do that um, uh, and introduce yourselves. We very much hope that that will be the nature of the discussion today. The sessions will be structured as conversations rather than as long um, presentations. Um, and what we're trying to achieve is very much that, um, that discussion nature. So um, take a moment to meet the person beside you before I then launch into some of the housekeeping, which is useful, but not so. <laughs>
All right, shall I call that now? Yes, yep, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> um, now, um, excuse me, having, um, Having unleashed an explosion of um, an explosion of conversation, <laughs> um, can I could I have everybody's attention again just for a minute? For the I need a bow, absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, right. Thank you, everybody. Um, having unleashed that explosion of conversation, I'm, um, I'm delighted to hear there's so many conversations that you want to launch into immediately. But I will draw your attention back for a second just for some housekeeping matters. Um, that was very successful. I didn't expect it to erupt in quite such an enthusiastic way, but I'm delighted it did. Um, now, I have made a list of the housekeeping issues because it's quite long. Um, and we'll start with the most important thing. The, the bathrooms are downstairs, uh, if people are looking. And um, with respect to any emergency procedures, which I'm sure we will not encounter, um, the exit is via the stairways. And we have a lot of people here who will help navigate any other issues. But um, as usual in an emergency, please just exit via the stairs. Um, we have uh, a um, Wi-Fi here for you to use today. Um, the, the, um, you access it as a visitor, and then the username is Energy Symposium, and the password is 3, and the at symbol OSPH. It's also at the bottom of all the holding slides, and you can check those details at the QR code at the end, and um, you, it'll be on the holding slide, so you can check those details again through the day or come and ask us. Um, the Twitter handle for the event, we're very happy for people to be tweeting as we proceed, is hashtag AU underscore DE underscore energy 2019. And again, that's at the bottom of the holding <coughs> slides. Um, please excuse the black screens beside me, and I apologize for the interruption during Mr. Herdan's video remarks. Um, we seem to be having issues with a cable, which we are trying to fix now. Um, the, what else is on my list? We do have a room for people to uh, leave their bags or jackets. We are aware that many people are traveling here today and may be traveling again tomorrow. The room is just down here. Um, we, it's not attended during the day, so please don't leave anything extremely valuable there or just be aware that, it's, that it is um, not, a, not attended or monitored. Um, for those who are speaking, we would invite you to come down to this room uh, 10 minutes before you speak so we can provide you with a lapel mic and you can meet your other panelists for the day. Um, it's always useful to know who it is that you're talking to before you're on stage. We, are, um, we have quite a busy agenda because we were very keen to have as many of you speaking and um, part of the conversation as possible, but that means we will be trying to keep to time. Um, at the end of the breaks, we'll play some music to signal that it's time to come back into the room rather than trying to harass you with bells. Um, but that is the purpose of the music. It's not just an accompaniment to the conversation. So please be aware that that's um, what we're signaling for you to do. And finally, I think that might be the last thing. Oh, yes, um, there have been some people who have arranged to have bilateral meetings alongside of the event today. Um, the meeting rooms are downstairs and we can help escort you to those meetings if you have them scheduled. Um, of course, many others may happen spontaneously, but for those who have them arranged, I would hope you know the timing of those meetings and um, we can help you locate the venues if, if you need assistance with that. Um, and finally, and I, probably most importantly, I would really like to extend our thanks to the hosting ministries, DOEE and BMWI, who are hosting today, and BMBF and DFAT, um, who are hosting the event tomorrow. 
Um, we would also like to um, extend our deep thanks to the organisations who have helped work with us to pull this event together. Adelphi, um, a Berlin-based think tank who is helping support the BMWI delegation here in Australia, um, and Architect and um, BDI staff who have worked closely with us to help support the attendance by that delegation who will be joining us this evening and tomorrow. Um, AHK has also worked closely with Adelphi, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and um, it really has been um, a pleasure to work with everybody who's been involved in this. Um, I've learned a great deal about events, as well as a lot of content about what's happening in Germany, that um, even though we work closely through the Energy Transition Hub, there, is new things happening. there are new things happening all the time, and um, it's been very interesting pulling this together. Um, so, so now I'd like to move on and introduce our first panel um, discussion for the day. I will introduce you to the chair of that session, Dr. Frank Jotzer, who is also a co-director of the Energy Transition Hub, but is based at ANU at the Crawford School of Government. Um, and I'll pass you over into his hands. Thank you. Yeah, great, and, and welcome once again uh, from, from the Energy Transition Hub. I think this is the first symposium I've been at this year that, weren't, that runs ahead of schedule. Uh, and that's just a testament to, I think, to how dedicated everyone is to, to these discussions. And, and a really great thank you, actually, I'd like to say to the Melbourne team of the Hub. They've done a fantastic job in organising this. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and actually, you know, this is something that's really important to the two lead universities on the Australian side here, University of Melbourne and ANU. Uh, the, this initiative, the, the hub, was established with the active engagement of both of the university presidents at the time. Um, and just as a little uh, um, indicator, right, if you, dis if you get this kind of venue at a university, okay, it must be of pretty high importance, all right? Um, so, so that's what you can see there. Um, and, and we're really excited, right? We're excited about the conversations that will happen here today uh, and, and tomorrow, and of course, uh, leading into the, the working group discussions by, uh, facilitated or hosted by governments on, on Friday. And we're really happy that we can play our role in, in helping facilitate those important conversations uh, between the two countries uh, where there's so much, uh, so much fruitful exchange of, of experience um, and thinking and, and inspiration, really, that, that can happen there. Uh, and we're also uh, really delighted that we've got um, all our friends, uh, colleagues, and, and visitors from Germany here uh, making making that uh, that long trip, so um, uh, Minister D'Ambrosio mentioned hydrogen quite quite prominently, and that's really a big topic, not so much today, but very much tomorrow, and I think all through um, the conversations that we're having uh, with German colleagues. Um, so we hosted a German delegation yesterday at ANU to to talk hydrogen. Uh, and, and many of those conversations will be happening. And I, I was really happy to hear from, from the minister just now that there's an indication of, of a healthy degree of competition already between uh, states apparently uh, in Australia for, for where uh, we might see um, a, a green hydrogen industry uh, emerge in Australia. So that's actually very, very prospective, I think, uh, for, for the energy transition, not just in Australia, uh, but in the world. This system, uh, this uh, session here now is of course about power system transition. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is, is set a bit of a baseline for, for the discussion um, all through the day. Um, now, uh, I, I encourage you to refer to the synthesis reports that have been uh, prepared. The red one uh, relates in particular to some of the issues um, that we're, uh, we're discussing in this session here today. So um, I believe there's some slides actually that we can show as well. And what they show are some of the, the stats that are included and, and that are also represented as charts in the online version of this. Of course, it's, it's online. So uh, just to uh, start with electricity uh, supply mix, that would be the first slide. Um, that's right. Um, so in both countries, of course, very rapid rise of renewables that we've seen over, over the last decade or so. Uh, Australia right now has the highest rate of annual deployment of solar photovoltaics per capita of any country in the world. Okay? Uh, what is, what, if, if 
things go up, others must fall. In Germany, what's falling is, is, is the contribution of coal and nuclear. Uh, in Australia, what has been falling is brown coal and gas. Uh, and in the future, of course, we'd expect in Australia naturally uh, also to see um, uh, reductions in black coal generation. In fact, uh, you know, if you look at the energy supply mix in the state of South Australia, that could well be uh, important of, of things to come. This is the last seven days uh, of South Australia's energy mix, taken from the Open NEM platform, uh, energy transition hub um, product. Um, and so you see that at various time, points in time, renewables uh, constituted 100% of, um, of electricity supply in South Australia at many, many points during the year. It's actually well above 100% gets exported back um, into Victoria. Gas still plays a very large role there. Uh, over time, you'd expect to see a greater, much greater amount of solar still, more wind as well, and an increasing role of storage. Uh, there is, of course, a large battery um, opening in, in that system. Now, going on uh, to, to emissions, the good news is emissions intensity as well as absolute emissions have been declining in both grids over time. Um, however, the rates of decline um, are at present not sufficient um, to, uh, to do the heavy lifting and achieving uh, national emissions targets. However, of course, that potential um, is there. Um, uh, and, and, and that need, that's what needs to happen because electrification of, of transport, of industry, of buildings is, of course, at the heart of decarbonisation of the energy system, and that needs to happen on the basis of zero emissions power. Um, now, what's important uh, is obviously prices and costs as well. Uh, wholesale prices in Australia for electricity used to be low and now relatively high. Uh, that's a worry. Uh, it hurts not just consumers, but industry as well. Uh, in future, you would expect the moderation of wholesale prices uh, just simply based on the fact that what's coming in in terms of new renewables um, um, capacity comes in at, at levelized costs and at contract prices that are actually well below uh, current wholesale prices. Um, Retail prices, um, not particularly cheap electricity uh, anymore in, in either country. Uh, in Australia, retail prices increased steeply over the last uh, decade or so. Much of that was actually due to the uh, expansion of the, of the network and distribution infrastructure, uh, and consumers need to be uh, paying back for that now, uh, more so than uh, due to the recent rise in, in wholesale prices. Um, and in, in Germany, a substantial part of the very high retail prices there actually due to taxes. And so that's an opportunity for policymakers, in fact, to, to rearrange the, the deck chairs and, uh, and, and perhaps alleviate uh, some of the taxes on, on electricity prices uh, and turn to other sources. Of course, environmental payments, uh, a legacy of high feed-in tariffs um, uh, is, is also a big part of... of um, uh, energy prices there. So transition in the electricity sector is underway, um, not just in energy supply, but also in the way uh, consumers use uh, electricity. In some cases, that's driven by policy, very clearly in terms of Germany's um, phase out of nuclear power and now announced also phase out of coal, right? That's policy. In other cases, change is increasingly driven by technological change uh, and by falling costs of new technologies. And Australia's present renewable uh, energy boom uh, can be very largely attributed uh, to that. So the questions, many, many questions, what kind of policies do we need to facilitate a transition? In Australia, what's the relative role of federal versus state action? Um, New technologies obviously need change in regulatory frameworks, may need change in market design. Uh, those reform processes, or at least the thinking about the reform processes that might follow, are underway in both countries. They're complex processes. There's no obvious, uh, correct answers as to, um, as to how to go about it, other than to perhaps uh, stay nimble, stay flexible, uh, and be open to reform. Uh, another issue is storage. In Australia, that's a real issue on account of no international interconnectivity. Pumped hydro storage seems the long-term future here. In the meantime, we're getting investment uh, in, in batteries. Yet another that's really rising is, of course, decentralized energy resources and how to more effectively and efficiently integrate them. And as we see the rise of the electric car, 
uh, that is set to be um, uh, a really big and important uh, issue. Now, if that change brings disruption as well, will bring uh, some opposition from some of the established uh, interests, um, and it is, of course, very much also a regional issue, and that's being increasingly uh, recognised uh, that uh, you know the communities uh, where where coal-fired power plays a big role um, have a transition uh, task on on their hands. Um, I could go on. I won't go on. Uh, instead, I will ask uh, our uh, distinguished panelists to the stage, please, um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll have. Uh, sort of a motivating talk from, from each of our four panelists, and then we'll launch into, into a conversation in the room. So first of all, we have uh, Alex Bonhaus from uh, AEMO, which is the Australian Energy Market Operator. Uh, and Alex is, is just in the process of establishing a new division um, that looks at system design, and uh, his title is the Chief System Design and Engineering Officer. He was earlier the Executive Director of Energy and Resources at CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. Uh, second, we have Anthea Harris. Anthea is a Senior Executive in the Victorian State Government. She's presently Deputy Secretary for Energy at the Department of Environment, Land, uh, Water and Planning, I think is the name of the department. Uh, she was previously uh, the head of the Secretariat of Australia's Climate Change Authority and a senior official in the then Department of Climate Change. And in fact, she helped the states um, uh, establish a blueprint for an emissions trading scheme. It was back in, I dare not mention it, I think 2005 it was, wasn't it? That, yeah? um, uh, next, we will have uh, Stefan Kapferer, who is the chairman of the General Executive Management Board of BDEW, which is Germany's federal association of the energy and water industry. So that is a very, very hefty industry association and one that has been, I think we can say that, very instrumental in, uh, in, in, in getting a compromise on, on the so-called coal phase-out in Germany through the, through the Coal Commission. Um, and last not least, we have uh, Falk Böhmecke, who you've already met, uh, the uh, head or deputy head or act acting head, I'm not sure, of the International Corp uh, Corporation on Energy Department of the Federal Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs uh, and Energy. So thank you very much to you all. Um, and uh, can I perhaps ask Alex to kick off uh, our discussions? Thank you very much, Frank, um, and good morning to you all. There's a very um, good Chinese proverb, or was it a curse, um, that says, may you live in interesting times. So congratulations. I think you are all, or we are all, living in very interesting times. Because in my view, the next decade in the energy sector is really going to be the defining decade that will set out the pathway for the rest of the century. And I'm not saying this lightly. If you actually look at any transformative technology revolution in history, it actually all plays out in a very similar fashion. You have a very short period um, where really the foundation is laid, and then the rest is sort of evolutionary and, and much less disruptive change following that. So take um, the advent of the internet um, in the 1990s, really the whole foundation was laid for that. Um, we introduced the base technology. We introduced the governance and the regulation of the system. We defined the topology um, and the interaction protocol of the whole system. And if you look at what's happened in the 2000.com boom, we probably tested every single business model that was out there and then some. Um, and that's not an isolated case. So any transformation, you look at the introduction of railways, automobiles, telephony, um, the first phase of electrification, they all happen in the same um, fashion. And I think we are, for better or worse, now at the beginning um, of this defining um, decade in the energy sector. That is not just a German phenomenon, that's not just an Australian phenomenon, but it is actually a global phenomenon. And it boils down, in my view, to four fundamental drivers that I think all of the nations are addressing in different degrees um, uh, of a sort of emphasis and urgency. Um, one is actually the exit of the existing generation fleet. Um, that is actually a key driver, certainly, 
in the Australian transition. Um, when you fast forward over the next 20 years, Australia will have to replace more than half of its existing generation fleet. So that is, that is quite a significant task to do um, in a very, very short amount of time. Actually faster than any other transformation that we have gone through. Um, second is a very strong uh, consumer preference that is emerging for distributed energy technologies. Um, actually, I've seen a really interesting statistics from Bloomberg the other day um, that put Australia just at the heels of Germany in second place in terms of the uptake of distributed energy technologies at around 15% um, um, of the total market. And according to their projection, it must be right, um, over the next five years, actually, Australia is going to overtake Germany, so you better watch out. Um, third, um, with the need to replace a lot of technologies, you know uh, that very well. Um, we now have the advent of really low-cost renewable uh, technologies. Certainly in the Australian context, this is some work that we're doing together with CSRO, we find that probably on a new-build energy basis, renewables are already... 30% um, cheaper than conventional generators. This is typically the point where then people say, yeah, oh, but what about dispatchability? Well, even if you looked at firm renewables, say wind, we've pumped hydro, that's probably on a par with the existing sources and with further declining technology costs, we would expect that that is really in the long run the lowest cost um, solution. And when you look at some of the forward projections that we're doing in, for example, the integrated system plan, and to replace that capacity um, that I've just highlighted, we have to have a phenomenal build of new large-scale generators. We have to probably install in the next 20 years about the same capacity that we have currently installed in the national electricity market in Australia just to compensate for those exiting generators. So in other words, in 20 years, we have to build uh, the national electricity market once over. Oh, and then there's another factor, which is climate change, um, which may actually accelerate that transformation that I've just talked about even further. Now, obviously, different countries, um, due to their circumstances, put different emphasis on those different drivers. Um, you know, in the Australian context, it's probably a, a, an accepted wisdom that we have to replace the existing generation fleet. Um, maybe there is different policy positions around climate change. Some of the states are sort of pushing this strongly, others um, maybe less so. But the challenges and the technological outcomes uh, that we have to solve are actually all very similar. And that's, I think, the real power of a symposium like this, because this helps us to uh, exchange some of the ideas. There's obviously a lot of challenges that we need to solve, but I thought I'll leave you with maybe four um, that are really top of mind for us as the market operator um, in Australia that are both really important to solve, um, and they are actually quite urgent to solve, because if we don't solve them, some of the projections that I've talked about that Frank has mentioned um, they might actually be sort of not come to fruition. So firstly, there's a technological challenge. Um, and in Australia, for better or worse, we are, I think, leading the world in some respect in terms of the integration of renewable energy in weak electricity systems. So where we have um, synchronous machines very far away. That might sound like a sort of like weird technical problem, but that is one of the key limiters to uptake uh, of renewable energy right now in Australia. So the, the system security issues that get created from that um, could, if not addressed, create a real barrier. So people often worry about, yeah, what happens when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining? I think we can solve that problem. We understand that very well. But keeping the system stable with that high amount of renewable generation, that's really the next challenge to solve. And it is a solvable challenge. We are actually working through one of those issues in real life right now. And we're doing this actually with some great support from um, one of the leading global manufacturers. And it's a German company. And I have to say, I'm actually very impressed with what you can achieve in this space um, with the right technology. Um, the second area that we're quite interested in is in the regulatory space. Um, it's actually, what is the right regulatory environment to foster an efficient, cost-effective design of the system? In Australia, we've adopted this approach of what's called the actionable integrated system plan. Um, 
and I might be biased, I think it's probably quite a, a good approach, but I think it's a, probably a good opportunity to share um, ways in which we can develop a low-cost, reliable, um, and secure future energy system going forward. But regulation and planning is not the only thing. I think there's also some really important questions around market design. Um, in our view in particular, um, how do you develop a firming market that appropriately revalues some of the services that we historically got effectively for free, that now we have to actually induce and appropriately value, such as dispatchability, such as system strength, inertia, frequency control, voltage control, etc. cetera. Uh, and last but certainly not least, distributed energy resources. Um, in sort of our projections, we see um, DER, as it's also called, maybe reaching up to 50% of the total market by uh, 2050. Um, but there are some near-term challenges that need to be addressed um, to, again, keep those systems stable and to use them in the most effective way, sort of, for example, through the coordination of, of virtual power plants. So that's just sort of a couple of issues um, that I really look forward to um, exploring together with you at this symposium and um, hopefully um, shaping the way and um, paving the path um, for the transition of the energy system. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Frank. Uh, and uh, I'll be the only person on the panel um, from the Australian side with an Australian accent, so that's my claim to fame for this morning. Um, I, just, I work for the Victorian Government, and you've already heard this morning um, from um, my Minister. Um, so you would have heard a bit about the Government's very clear, the Victorian Government's very clear objectives in the energy and climate change space. So the Victorian Government uh, has a commitment to be um, cut to be net zero emissions by 2050 overall. Uh, and it, in the renewable energy space, it has a legislated target to achieve a 50% renewables target by 2030. And it's in the process now of thinking about uh, what its climate change targets will be going out to 2030. And as the minister said, those announcements will be made uh, in the first half of next year. Um, so that's really the backdrop at which we are thinking about energy policy here in Victoria. In terms of the current challenges that we are facing here in Victoria, um, just for our, the benefit of our German guests, we account here in Victoria for about a quarter of the national electricity market. Uh, we're uh, our particular um, contributions in that market. Um, it's been heavily dominated historically by brown coal generation, which produced uh, virtually all of the power um, in decades gone by, and obviously undergoing a very rapid transformation now. One of the big issues for us, um, uh, which Alex has alluded to, is comes from the fact that the existing coal-fired power stations are very lumpy. And so when uh, one of them closes, that's a very large proportion of our electricity supply that goes all at once. Uh, and replacement resources tend to be smaller, um, more numerous. Uh, and so the idea of being able to make sure that we can coordinate uh, closure with um, adequate new resources in all the forms that, that could take generation, transmission, storage, all of the kinds of resources that we might need to replace closing coal-fired power stations is clearly something that the Victorian government is intensely interested in. Uh, and need, we really need to make sure that that transition occurs uh, very, very smoothly. The Victorian government right now is going through, um, from a historical perspective, the highly unusual situation of being um, our demand and supply balance is very tight uh, at the moment. We had one of our very old coal-fired power stations shut a couple of years ago, uh, and that really was, we'd gone from a situation of being, having huge amounts of extra capacity in our system. Frank was writing papers about what are we going to do about all this extra capacity in our system. Um, we don't write those papers anymore. Uh, we're in a situation now where um, really our issue is how do we uh, make sure that our market delivers the kind of extra capacity and the kind of capacity and the services that we need uh, and how do we make sure that that all happens in time. 
Another one of the key challenges facing us here in Victoria is a geographic one. So historically, our power came from these very large coal-fired power stations located in the Latrobe Valley, which is about 100, 150 kilometres uh, east of here. Big fat transmission lines bring that, bring that power here to Melbourne. Uh, as we are building out our system with um, transforming for renewables, they're in completely different places. So people have been building in the southwest, in the northwest, uh, picking up um, our very good resources for both wind and solar resources. Uh, unfortunately, that's not where our transmission system is at its strongest, and we are facing a whole range of issues now where uh, our transmission system really needs to be built out to catch up uh, with the new locations of where um, our plant might be uh, located for our future grid. That business of trying to coordinate um, transmission build and generation is clearly one that uh, has got a way to go. It's not a smooth process uh, right now. Uh, and uh, we're currently in a, a situation where in uh, too little, too late world for many areas, and we need to make sure that that system somehow is um, able to be uh, more smoothly aligned. As Alex mentioned, the issue of integrating um, distributed energy resources, a key issue for us here in um, Victoria as well. The government itself is investing uh, $1.3 billion in terms of uh, subsidising more solar um, systems uh, and some batteries and some solar hot water systems as well into our grid. Um, one of the key um, benefits of um, the government being involved is that there's a degree of influence that the government can exert about uh, how that distribution uh, the distributed energy resources can be integrated into our grid. So if you're helping pay for it, you get to do things like specify what kinds of technologies are allowed and what kinds of ones aren't allowed. We want to make sure that the quality of installations is top notch. Thinking ahead further, we would need to be thinking about how can we use our leverage in the fact that we have this scheme to be able to make sure that we are making the most of these resources to be able to contribute to the grid in the way that we know that it should be able to. All of these kinds of issues mean that we've got a huge job ahead uh, at a national level to think about what is the basic fundamental market design that we need um, to be able to support an entirely different uh, set of um, basic technologies and a different way of being able to interact um, with the market. As the Minister said this morning, we've uh, established our market uh, about 20 years ago now and it's a really the time for us to be looking is it still fit for purpose or do we need to be able to make sure that it can transform so that this market actually rewards and encourages the kinds of investments that we want to see uh, at all levels in our in our market. So I've talked a lot about all sorts of challenges and problems of course there are a lot of opportunities as well. Um, Victoria uh, and Australia overall is blessed with um, really quite exceptionally good renewable resources which surely must provide a great base to be thinking about competitive advantage going forward. Uh, we know that we can, um, be able, we can produce a, uh, an electricity and energy system more broadly that is uh, cleaner and affordable and more efficient. Um, the Minister also highlighted the jobs and economic development opportunities that should be able to flow uh, from that. Finally, I think everyone will need to be uh, mentioning hydrogen, at least today, as a, as a precursor for their discussions tomorrow. Um, you've probably heard, uh, in fact, um, Rachel alluded to that this morning, the um, hydrogen project that's happening uh, in the Latrobe Valley. This is, a, this is a project designed to convert uh, brown coal to hydrogen um, with cut, combined with carbon capture and storage, of course, for a, a, um, so to make sure we're not making a, a net contribution to greenhouse emissions. But we're also wanting to uh, explore the opportunities for green hydrogen, hydrogen produced from 
uh, hopefully what would be an excess of renewable uh, energy production. This is something that, again, Victoria thinks that it um, has potential advantages for, and we are certainly actively thinking about how might we encourage both on the supply side uh, for hydrogen, but also thinking about what's the appropriate steps we should be taking uh, on the demand side, at least domestically, um, for hydrogen and what might a sensible transition uh, on that front look like. I shall leave it there and leave it for discussion. Thank you. Concern about supply of electricity is very understandable in Victoria. So most of the electricity that we're using in this room comes from these three brown coal generators. And one of them we hear is, is creaking and, um, and will need to be replaced at some point in a not too distant future. We, um, we have been facing uh, a situation of uh, a rising rate of forced outages amongst our uh, existing plant. I think today we've got more than 2,000 megawatts off of uh, thermal plant, so um, it's something that we're increasingly having to deal with. And Anthea, the papers we're writing about coal and coal exit these days are about how to better achieve a predictable and orderly uh, transition <laughs> from, from coal to, to renewables, which could also be a, ch a, a quicker transition, um, but, but orderly and predictable is, is really uh, the, the headline for that. I forgot to mention before, Mr. Kapferer, um, you need to know this as background, used to be State Secretary for, of, the, of the Ministries of um, Economic Affairs and Energy as well as of Health, and so um, his insights into policy making processes are one would think, informed uh, by, by a seat uh, very close to, to the cabinet in the past. Please, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, Alex mentioned at the beginning in his introductory remarks that uh, the next decade will be a decisive one when we talk about the transformation of the power system in our countries. And I think that's an interesting message because if you would ask German people how far we are with uh, transforming our power system in Germany, most Germans would answer, oh yes, we did a lot in the last 20 years. Uh, what we have achieved in the last 20 years, and you could see it in the slides shown by Frank at the beginning, is that the share of renewable energy increased in the first half of this year to 44% of our electricity production. But at the same time, the installed capacity of fossil power plants is nearly the same as it was 10 years ago. The working hours are shrinking, of course, and we halved our nuclear power generation in Germany, but when you look at the lignite and the, the black coal power generation in Germany, the installed capacity is relatively stable in the last uh, 20 years. So there's a lot to do. There's a long way to go. Uh, and first of all, um, the situation is a little bit different, of course, in Germany as it is in Australia, because we are well integrated in a single market of energy in the European Union. But I will come back to this aspect later on, because uh, this is a very relevant one when we talk about firm capacity, security of supply for the future. Uh, what is needed uh, now, because after the decision of the so-called coal commission, we have to replace and to phase out our coal-based power generation in the next 19 years. And you know we have also to finalize in the next three years the phasing out of the nuclear power plants in Germany. Uh, but what is an, an interesting figure is we have to replace, and, and Alex mentioned replacing, and that's true, we have to replace 50 gigawatt of firm capacity in the power system in Germany. 40 gigawatt of them is uh, coal-based and 10 gigawatt is still uh, nuclear. So first of all, we need additional investment in renewable energy. And uh, you all may know that uh, Germany is well known for this uh, feed-in tariff system. We have established 20 years ago in Germany. Uh, but this is no longer a discussion about uh, investment. This is no longer a discussion about uh, business cases when we talk about renewable energy. More and more, it is a discussion about public acceptance in Germany, because you all know that Germany is a very densely populated country. So when we discuss about uh, 
needed uh, installed additional capacity of uh, renewable energy. We discuss about uh, 100 gigawatt additional installed capacity needed till 2030. This is a problem of space. And there is more and more discussion, not only about transmission lines, Jochen Hohmann knows it very well, it's also a discussion about onshore wind capacities, which is becoming more and more difficult in our system. Second aspect, in an industrialized country where the industry is in the west and in the south of the country, but a lot of the installed capacity of wind is in the north, is a discussion about expanding the power grid. Of course, the distances are not as long as they are in Australia, but once again, the densely populated countryside is not very happy and amused if there are more and more transmission power lines from the north to the south. So this is the second very important aspect. And the third aspect, yes, electricity consumption, and that's good news, in Germany was slightly shrinking in the last decade, and that's maybe a surprise when we discuss sector coupling when we have seen that GDP growth rate was relatively strong in Germany in the last decade, and due to the migration crisis, we had a lot of uh, people coming to Germany and population was growing in Germany. At the same time, electricity consumption was shrinking slightly. So I'm very optimistic that it will stay stable in the next uh, decade, also when uh, electric vehicles will become more and more relevant in the transport sector maybe one additional figure, 10 million electric vehicles in Germany will increase the electricity consumption by only 4%. So this is possible to handle, uh, but also then we need a replace of the um, installed capacity because the peak load in the system, a peak load of around 80 gigawatt in Germany will stay the same. So what about firm capacity? Many people are convinced that this is very easy to handle in an integrated uh, energy, single energy market in Germany, uh, in Europe. But you may know that most of our European neighbors have similar trends like we have. They reduce coal-based power generation. Some of them do no longer invest in nuclear power plants. Most of them increase the share of renewable energy. So this is a very similar situation. Of course, interconnections are becoming better and better. Of course, we will see more exports and imports. But at the end, if this is really a reliable firm capacity for all our countries in Europe, it's not clear yet. So we need an investment not only in renewable energy, not only in the grid expansion, we also need an investment in gas capacities. Additional 20 gigawatt of gas capacities will be needed in Germany, and in the long run, we have the same discussion like in Australia. What about hydrogen? Because everybody knows if we take the Paris Agreement for serious, uh, natural gas is only a bridge technology to green gas and hydrogen gas based technologies and power generation in the future. So conclusion, it is possible to phase out nuclear power plants and coal power plants at the same time in an industrialized country. But there are a lot of challenges to tackle and there is a lot of investment needed. And this is still a very ambitious goal for Germany we have to achieve in the next 20 years. Thank you very much. And we have many constraints on the energy system and the, and the transformation in Australia, but space, space is not one of them. <laughs> so, um, Falk Böhmeke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, let me start with something I didn't want to talk about, but since Alex mentioned it, um, I, I start with mentioning the reasons why we're doing energy transition. Um, and our main driver is climate protection. That is the reason why it's called Climate Cabinet. Uh, that's the reason why Angela Merkel is going to New York at uh, the end of the week on Sunday, attending the Climate Summit by the United Nations. We are talking about climate protection and how to reach the goals that all nations agreed on in Paris. 
uh, that is our main driver, but we have a very good partner in getting there, and that's pure economics. And you have also mentioned that already. Um, this, this is a strong partner because now we can argue we don't only do it to protect the globe from global warming, but we do it out of economic reasons. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, and I'm, I'm not arguing just do it because it's easy. I'm arguing just do it because it's necessary out of climate reasons, but it also makes sense because it's an investment in the future. And when, when we were walking here, we were talking about that I studied uh, at the University of Sydney in 2001 and that my parents had to pay for it. Um, and you could say, oh, that's a, that's a big cost for your parents. But my parents would have argued it was an investment in the future. And that's how I see the investments in the energy field too. It's an in investment in the future of the energy system, of economic development, and probably of our societies, because we see a global movement for energy transition. We see it everywhere in the world. Um, disregarding sometimes major policy directions. Uh, for example, in the US, we have the second largest market for renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, and you all know the politics. What are our goals in Germany? Uh, they're very similar to the Australian goals that have, mentioned, have been mentioned. There's a sustainability goal, I talked about that, the climate goal. Uh, we want to keep the system affordable, um, and that's when I talked about the costs. Obviously, we, we need to be most cost efficient, um, as, as cost efficient as possible, and we need to keep uh, the system stable, and, and you have talked about that a lot, and I do understand uh, the concerns uh, that go with that, um, but I would say don't blame it on the renewables if there is instability. We have 44% of renewable energy in our system, and we have one of the most stable systems in the world. Um, it was mentioned by Thorsten Herdan in the video message, we have 12 minutes of power outages per year, which is basically nothing, that is maintenance. Um, there is only one country that is more stable than Germany, and that is Denmark. It has like 10 minutes of power outages, and they have 55% of renewables in the system. So stability and renewables don't exclude each other. Again, I'm not saying it's easy and it's a no-brainer. You need a lot of brains uh, to think about how to make that possible. Um, but it is, it is possible, and system integration of renewable energy, I think there is something Germany has 20 years of experience in, uh, and we are happy to share this experience. When we started, people were saying, oh, more than 10% of renewable energy in our system, that's gonna cause a big problem. There is no problem. I mean, there is, a lot has happened, but there is not a problem of stability uh, in, in our system. Where are we going in, in Germany? Uh, some things have been mentioned. Until 2030, we want to have 65% of renewables in our system, so increase the 40% that we had last year to 65. At the same time, we're phasing out nuclear until 2022. That's a very, I would say, German thing to do but let's not discuss about phasing out of nuclear, if it makes sense or not. The society in Germany has made that decision, and there is no politician in Germany who would argue, at least no sensible politician, or no politician who wants to be elected, um, that would argue otherwise. So let's, let's just take that as a given. Um, at the same time, we had the so-called coal commission, Stefan Kapfer was part of that, and. Um, the commission has made recommendations to the government to phase out coal until 2038. The government still has to implement that, put it into law, but that's gonna happen until the end of this year. We have to strengthen our grid infrastructure, that was mentioned uh, already, and the reasons for that, our renewable um, energy sources 
are mainly in the north, at, at least when it comes to wind, because we have the coast there, so we have offshore wind, we have onshore wind, but our load centers are in the west and in the south. And we want to strengthen our European grid and to strengthen um, uh, power exchange with our electrical neighbors. Uh, and we are working very closely with the European Commission and our European uh, neighbors uh, on that. And then the last thing uh, to show you our roadmap towards uh, 2030 is we were very successful in the power sector, um, but now we also need to duplicate these successes in the other sectors, in transport, in buildings, in industry, um, because that's maybe something we would do differently if we could all start over. We would, have, we would probably do it more holistically from the very beginning. We started with the power sector, we were very successful there, but now it's difficult uh, to combine the power sector with other sectors, especially because we increased the electricity price uh, by leverages on that. And if you want to make people use, for example, an electric car, it's not a very good argument if electricity is very expensive. So that, that's something we're looking into now. And that's also the, actually the main part of the climate cabinet um, on Friday to look into the other sectors, how we're gonna reach the targets there. I wanna stop here and uh, I'm open for discussions. I may, let me mention one more thing. Um, I'm, I'm heading the division for international cooperation. And that's exactly what we are trying to find, international partners who are going uh, with us the route of a global energy transition. Um, we are finding them multilaterally in energy organizations, but we're also looking for bilateral partners. And Australia, from our point of view, is a very important partner because we can exchange on different things uh, that we have learned. We have something to share probably in the electricity sector, but we're looking at South Australia with uh, battery storage. We don't have a lot of large scale, we don't have large scale battery storage. So we're looking at um, partners who share their experiences with that. And then hydrogen was mentioned many times. I also want to mention it. That is something uh, we are looking into. Alan Finkel visited uh, Germany and uh, I think the, the second ever appointment our new state secretary had was with Alan Finkel. And it was so impressive that he ordered us to also have a national hydrogen strategy. So let's see who is first. We also want to finish until the end of this year. So, uh, and then let's compare notes. Thank you. Well, uh, a perfect example of mutual learning and, and emulation of, of positive approaches then. So Falk, you studied in Sydney, and of course this is one of the ways that we make friends in the world, by having people come here and experience firsthand. Uh, what this country has to offer. And I suppose we should also say thank you to you and your, your family for the, the fees that went to your university <laughs> at the time. Uh, in fact, education, education is the third largest export commodity for Australia behind iron ore and coal. Uh, so, you know, this is important to keep in mind in terms of when we think of longer term structural transition uh, as well. So, um, we've heard about many, many fascinating topics in, in power system transitions. Many of these issues will come back in greater detail throughout the day. We have a session on flexibility options. We have a session on market reform. We have a session on uh, regional structural uh, transition. And of course, tomorrow will be a, a big day for broader systems thinking, where we'll talk about the kind of uh, analysis that has been done uh, including in the hub on integrated systems that go to 100% renewables and in Australia's case, in fact, go to 200% renewables when we think of a power system that is linked to uh, a renewable export system that produces hydrogen, that produces other synthetic fuels and commodities and thereby providing additional flexibility and possibly uh, electricity for domestic consumption at lower average cost than you would get under a only 100% renewable, okay? So to many people, this sounds like, uh, you know, dreaming, 
um, to us as we're doing the analysis, this sounds as a very real and in many ways very, very desirable vision for decades to come. Um, now, we've got, I'm delighted we have plenty of time for, for discussion, for conversation in the room. And so what I would encourage you to do, please indicate to me if you want to make a comment, ask a question, and when the microphone reaches you, why don't you stand up so we can all see you? That'll, it'll just help uh, getting to know each other. And why don't you also state your name and, uh, and uh, your affiliation? That'll, that'll be helpful. So who will kick us off? Dylan, in the back. OK, and then I saw a hand here. Thanks, yeah. Rick. Um, I have a question for Stefan, I think. Um, this strange idea has emerged in the Australian context that uh, the Germans have paid to keep their coal plants open. Um, and my understanding is that uh, several years ago, for essentially climate reasons, you paid to close them, to actually close them, not to keep them open. Um, and uh, th I'm talking about this uh, lignite strategic reserve. Um, so for the benefits of the Australians in the audience, would you be able to perhaps explain uh, th the, this lignite strategic reserve a little bit more and uh, what it does and any lessons you've learned around that particular process? Yeah, of course, every decision about phasing out coal power plants is linked to a regional situation where lignite mining is still relevant. You may know that there are three areas in Germany where we still have lignite mining. Uh, two of them are in the former eastern part, in the former GDR. So in, especially in one of these regions, there are still a lot of jobs linked to the lignite mining, less to the power generation, more to the mining situation. And uh, Germany phased out its hard coal mining in the last uh, 20 years, but uh, still has a lot of lignite mining. So reducing power generation of uh, lignite-based coal power plants is with a very clear impact to the regional uh, employment situation in these areas. Uh, uh, so we had a discussion a few years ago about reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions by lignite uh, coal power plants, which are the cheapest one in the uh, current situation, of course, in Germany, with a relatively low uh, CO2 price in the ETS uh, at this time. Uh, and uh, this was the idea to organize this so-called strategic reserve. To be very frank, the, the strategic reserve didn't work any hour till now. So we pay a lot of taxpayers' money to these companies and to these regions, but it has not a negative impact to the greenhouse gas emissions of Germany in the last decades. But uh, to be very um, uh, frank, uh, every phasing out situation, if it is based on the ETS system in Germany or in Europe, or if it is based on a political decision elsewhere, will have a lot of cost for the regional structural reforms. We will discuss it, I'm sure, in the afternoon. So it's not so easy to say another system of phasing out the coal power plants would have been cheaper at the strategic reserve has been. Gentlemen, yeah, yeah, please. Australian company with a German parent. Um, RWE is a ma majority shareholder. Uh, my question was, um, you mentioned that it would be, a, a, I think, a crazy politician that would uh, talk about uh, extending the life of nuclear in, in Germany. But um, in Australia, we have a lot of brave politicians. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, I think we don't have a, a brave politician that would set an end date for coal. And I'm just wondering um, what insights you have about how that, um, that decision was made and, and insights for Australia. Uh, and please, in the meantime, do indicate to me if you want to ask a question, we can move it. Uh, perfect. Okay. Please. Um, so your question is why there is a decision to phase out coal? More how. How? how? Okay. No, that, that's, uh, that's a very important uh, question because um, everything we mentioned now has more or less forgotten the most important fact, and that is acceptance of the population. You need the acceptance, uh, because otherwise, obviously, you, you are not elected, and then you can't 
uh, go through with the measures uh, of your energy transition. In Germany, we tend to forget it a little bit because uh, the general acceptance of the energy transition is still very, very high. Surprisingly high, I would say, because we have also increased our electricity prices, um, but, but people accept that there needs to be change. And now the discussion is how, how do you do that? Um, and when you talk about how do you do it, and that's grid extension, and that's more onshore wind, and then uh, suddenly the acceptance of the people who are actually affected is not so high anymore. And the same um, uh, goes for a coal exit or a nuclear exit. So what, what does the population uh, think about that? Um, in Germany, we, I think there was the general acceptance that we need to do something to reduce CO2 emissions. That was general acceptance. And then the question was, how do we implement uh, a coal exit? Uh, and the idea was to set up a commission, a commission that consists of all players in society, including unions, including industry, um, including NGOs, uh, including everybody who, who would be infected, uh, representatives of the regions, of the, of the mining regions, and so on. And this commission had the task to make a recommendation to the government. Stefan Kapfer can talk about, uh, more about it because he was part of this commission. And the commission recommended a coal phase out within 20 years. That's why we're talking about 2038, uh, because they made the recommendations, or they were supposed to make the recommendations by 2018. It was beginning of 2019 in the end. Um, and because they, we had this commission combining everybody, it's a generally accepted recommendation all over industry, society, NGOs, um, and, and politics. As, as a ministry and as politicians, we kind of, we weren't on the table because it was an independent commission. So they made uh, recommendations that have a price tag. And now we have the challenge to implement these recommendations and paying for it. Um, but, but since it is such a broad consensus, I think there is no political argument in not doing it. It's just uh, the question how to do it in the most efficient way. It would be good to hear more, actually, about the Coal Commission. Frank, only a few remarks. Um, as a former member of this uh, so-called Coal Commission, from the beginning, we had not a conflict in the commission that a coal exit or phasing out of the coal power plants is needed. This was very clear. The main discussion from the beginning was first, when do we organize the phase out of the coal power plants? Of course, uh, NGOs, the environmental organizations were uh, interested in a phase out in 2030. The regions were interested in 2042, 2043. But there was not a conflict about this phasing out is needed. And the, the most of the time, uh, and, and there is another member of the commission here in the room, Felix Mattes, most of the time we, we worked on what is needed to organize it, not to discuss is it necessary or not, uh, why should it happen or not. Most of the time we worked on what is really needed, uh, what about the renewable energy, what about uh, reliability of supply, what about um, grid expansion, what about structural reforms in the regions. So this was most of the time we worked on it for six months. And uh, I think we are all really proud about the result, uh, not, not only about the consensus in this uh, commission, about the result, because you can feel it if you read the recommendations that uh, 28 people worked really hard for six months to organize all these different aspects of the phasing out situation. Andrea, yeah, I would like to ask you, um, a coal, coal commission for, for Australia, or for Victoria, would it be a good idea? I think the government hasn't made um, decisions about how it wants to um, handle, essentially, the um, uh, coal closures um, yet. Um, it's something, obviously, that it's actively thinking about and how it might um, 
make sure that um, it can meet all its objectives in that transition around uh, keeping the lights on, um, making sure that the um, re affected regional area is looked after, uh, and making sure that um, uh, that energy stays affordable. So at this stage, I don't have uh, something that um, a potted answer for you, but it's clearly something that we're thinking about how we can manage to achieve all of those objectives. I mean, more, more broadly, uh, an approach like the you know the the coal commission. I guess has, has, has many things to, to commend itself, namely the attempt to identify a consensus that, a consensus that may actually hold um, in, you know, in the political um, ups and downs that may come down the line with a very broad stakeholder representation. It, it strikes me personally that, that, yeah, that in some ways you know, the, the politics of climate change have been so difficult in Australia that perhaps this, you know, this institutional approach to to identifying some way forward might might be something that uh, that is worth considering uh, in, in this country as well. Anyway, next uh, comment or question. Uh, my name is Danny Alexander. I come from Sydney, uh, at the University of Technology in Sydney, at the Institute for Sustainable Futures, and it's been great to hear you speak about the transition and. I suppose the supply side of that in terms of variable renewables and also options uh, in terms of storage and transmission to address this transition but I was interested in maybe all your perspectives on the demand side of resource and how that fits because it's potentially the lowest cost option and I mean that in a broader context than demand response and, and an emergency response in that sense, but actually as a full resource that can deliver capacity. So Danielle, uh, really great question because I think you're right. We, um, we talk a lot about supply side, we talk a lot about the grid, and we often forget about the demand and the consumers. And it is a huge opportunity. And actually when, when we talk about distributed energy resources, we actually think that part of that resource is actually what we do with the demand. And um, I think there is a lot of potential to do much more. Um, there's actually a couple of uh, rule changes going through the Australian system at the moment, um, which certainly from our side we very strongly support and in fact would like to see even accelerated uh, because it unlocks market benefits and it also actually creates a real opportunity for some of the really immediate challenges that we are facing. Actually with the sort of exit of coal um, with the decreased amount of reliability that Anthea also mentioned, when we looked at what is actually the cheapest way to fill this gap, actually demand side response is actually the best way uh, to do that in the most cost effective way. And it's also the most equitable way because we have a big debate in Australia, well, should we make consumers pay more for more reliable electricity? And the problem is, well, it's probably a very individual decision. But when you have a mechanism like demand response, you can actually let consumers make the choice. Those who want to have more reliable electricity can enjoy that. Those who actually prefer price, they can sell their capability into that market, so be supported. Um, I'd certainly agree about the importance of energy efficiency and demand response. Um, I remember hearing Fatih Birol speak from the International Energy Agency years ago now, and he was talking about energy efficiency uh, as the blue-collar work of the uh, energy sector. If you want fame and glory, he said, you go and work on oil. Um, but actually, uh, energy efficiency is tremendously important for our um, energy systems. Uh, we can see it in the numbers, the contribution that it would, will have made while in in similar to um, Germany, while we've had a rapidly expanding population uh, here in Australia and in Victoria in particular, uh, we haven't seen demand um, rising uh, at, at the same rate by any stretch of the imagination. Um, some of that is just the changing nature of our economy and the you know, increasing rise of uh, services, a proportion of our economy, which is of course less emissions intensive, but the contribution that um, the slow, quiet work of energy efficiency and things like building standards, um, appliance standards, those kinds of things in the background, plus the injection of other policies that, that have promoted energy efficiency in various ways have definitely made a contribution. 
In terms of demand response, uh, we certainly uh, concur and, uh, uh, with Alex in thinking that um, there must be better ways to be able to tap into this resource. We've probably got a few twin things going on in that front, so um, how can we um, make sure that the technology enables demand response in a way, particularly for small customers, in a way that's easy and you don't really have to think about it and um, uh, that you can pre-agree certain things and demand response can be automated. Um, so there's a technological side of that, which I'm sure will get sorted out. And, uh, but then there's the market rules side of that, which is probably the harder bit, uh, making sure, you know, who exactly uh, does what in this, in this kind of new world order, which is something that Australia is really still thinking through exactly how all of that's going to work. Um, huge amount of potential, already making great strides, it feels like, um, but still quite a way to go. We have currently have six, seven, uh, comments lined up, um, so things are speeding up a little. Wonderful. <laughs> Gentleman on the right. And then Anita. Um, thanks. Uh, my name's Alan Pearce. I'm a fellow at the Climate and Energy College and at RMIT University. I'm, I'm kind of following on a bit from Danny's question. My obsession is the energy efficiency demand side space, as some local people will know. Um, and I guess in the context of this discussion, uh, what interested me is the Australian energy market operator's recent uh, forecasts where when you look 15 or 20 years out, the high demand scenario is 50% higher than the low demand scenario. Um, so I'm interested in what, what kind of work is going on behind that to lead to scenarios like that. But also uh, it does raise the question for potential investment in the supply side when effectively your forecasts are chalk and cheese, um, that can potentially create uh, quite a lot of uncertainty for investors and how might people deal with that kind of uncertainty? Is that for Alex? Or? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <It would> be. <laughs> Well, Alan, firstly, I'm really delighted that you have had a look at the um, recently published integrated system plan assumptions, so <laughs> good. Um, second comment is, we actually believe the future is, is, is actually very hard to predict, which is why we have actually created a whole range of different assumptions. And, and yes, we have a, a high demand growth assumption, but we also have actually a slow demand and a couple of scenarios in between, and actually now also a, a scenario that might ha help us hit the actual Paris target. Um, and I think that's quite important not to pick one in isolation, but actually look at the spectrum, because well, the, the difficult challenge that we have to navigate is, is actually finding a, a pathway that's a sensible pathway in this uncertain future. But coming back to your um, actual question, so what's going into the high demand scenario is in the, the biggest driver, frankly, is population growth. Um, and um, this obviously is determined by, um, by policy settings, especially around immigration. Um, and then there's obviously a, um, the, the, probably the second biggest driver is the, is the industrial uh, development. But um, we'd be keen to have a, a more in-depth discussion about that as well. Underlying all of that is still a very uh, strong assumption for a growth in energy efficiency that um, we would certainly see happening at the same time. What is, the, what is the German system for creating scenarios for the transition? A very good question because also our forecasts are very widespread when we talk about electricity consumption in the future. I mentioned some figures what has happened in the last decade and what is interesting to me is that the energy consumption as a whole in Germany is in 2018 at the level of the beginning of the 70s last century. So the energy efficiency in Germany is growing extremely fast. And, and I expect for the next uh, decades that it will happen the same. So um, from my perspective, the electricity demand in Germany will be uh, uh, stable. It will not uh, grow extremely. And it's very clear that the transport sector will use more and more electricity in the future in Germany. So, in the housing sector, I'm not so convinced that it will be based on electricity, mainly in the new constructed houses, yes, but not in the existing more than 40 million flats. Um, and 
the most relevant part of uh, our prediction for the future is the uh, network uh, expanding plan of the um, Bundesnetzagentur and the TSOs in Germany. And, and Jochen Hohmann, who is the president of the regulatory agency in Germany, he is with us today. Uh, he knows it best that all these aspects are discussed. What about demand side management? What about renewable? What about fossil power plants? So this is a very well discussed and planned forecast of the future for the electricity system in Germany. Yeah, maybe just to to add on that, the we, we do have the scenario planning uh, too, but we all know it's hard to predict the future. Um, so maybe a more general remark on our topic, which is power system transition, is it's a change of mindset. You, you change everything in your power system. Um, you change the production, you change how you distribute, you change your grids, um, and you want to decrease demand in general. So you want to be as efficient as, as possible. So we have LED lighting here, we have triple glazed windows. Uh, that's great, there's probably some potential in our hotel. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but you need, you, you know, you need potential to go forward. Um, no, but what I'm arguing is the whole, the whole system you need to newly set up. Um, and efficiency is part of it, and then the demand side is, is definitely part of it. So we try to get rid of, uh, of the term base load. We don't need base load. We need at every given minute or second um, that you have as much supply as demand. And you can either reduce demand if you don't have enough supply or you can increase the supply. Um, it doesn't really matter. So the, how do you organize that? And that is the difficult question. Uh, you need a market design that does reward flexibility. Um, and we're trying to, we have set up a market design and we're trying to make it better and better to actually get these rewards. Um, and then the market players will act accordingly. Um, that, is, that is the big challenge um, and that becomes very technical and, and there, uh, you can discuss about a lot of details about market design. But that's the general idea that we uh, actually get demand and supply at every given second together. Yeah, thank you. From um, Siemens, a small German company you may have uh, uh, heard of. <laughs> Um, when we talk about uh, energy transition, some of the technologies that have made an impact, uh, we do uh, very well regard uh, uh, German technology in Australia also when we think of um, solar inverters or uh, wind turbines and other technologies. And I see an emerging uh, opportunity in power to X and hydrogen, um, uh, which, uh, which has been mentioned a number of times. Sure, will be explored tomorrow, but I'm very interested to know. We, um, we heard from Lily D'Ambrosio this morning about the Japanese um, uh, project um, uh, led by Kawasaki for hydrogen in Australia. What kind of opportunities might you see for German to take advantage of the you know, playground opportunities in Australia for um, yeah, power to X and, and hydrogen to support sector coupling so that we really drive some of this um, uh, air transition out through industry transport and so on? Well, we see, as, as has been mentioned many times, we see a lot of potential for hydrogen, but we're looking into it very closely. That's why we're setting up the strategy. And we are obviously always looking at our partners around the world, what they are doing and what experience they are, they are having. We see, um, well, I can't really say what we see because the strategy isn't out there, but I personally see that uh, there is a great potential for green hydrogen. So, as I said, our main driver is climate policy in this area. So, if you talk about the future of heating, future of uh, using electricity, uh, using energy in the industry, then we see hydrogen has a role to play, but it must be carbon neutral hydrogen. Otherwise, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. 
So if we are talking about projects for carbon neutral hydrogen, we would be very interested to look into it. Um, but there are many ways of producing hydrogen from electricity, so that will be the key question. I want to only add one thing. There is one difference to Australia. Most of this hydrogen will not be produced in Germany. And there are two reasons for that. One reason is, and you, you may remember the slide of Frank at the beginning, taxes, fees and levies at the electricity prices in Germany are extremely high. So there is no business case for hydrogen. And the second aspect, and, and I fully agree with Falk, that uh, it has to be green hydrogen. Uh, we have not enough areas and, and space for renewable energy. So it will happen in Morocco, in Norway, wherever in Europe, but mainly not in Germany. And we don't have enough sun. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Antje, I'll spring a question on you again. When your minister speaks about hydrogen, Victoria, what color will that be? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> the, the minister is particularly um, interested in looking for future opportunities for green hydrogen. Of course, um, we have um, the Kawasaki arrangement um, down in the Latrobe Valley, and so um, the Victorian government is strongly supportive, obviously, of that project to um, be able to produce hydrogen from. Uh, brown coal. I think in terms of uh, a national strategy going forward, um, uh, I think um, certainly Alan discussing discussions with Alan Finkel um, would look at the green hydrogen opportunities for the future uh, and uh, seeing how brown hydrogen can kind of fit with that as a, as a, um, a part of that solution, um, but not certainly not the whole of it. Uh, and um, in terms of the future opportunities for a country with uh, the renewable resources that Australia has, it would be a very strange situation not to be able to use that for an excess, to use that excess uh, opportunity to be able to produce hydrogen. Question is somewhere in this neck of the woods. On the, yeah, great, okay. Hi, uh, my name's Troy Dunn. I'm from the New South Wales branch of the United Services Union. Um, I have a comment sort of ending with a question um, and I'd ask you to bear with me because now that I have the microphone I've gone blank. Um, we can come back if we no, no, it's no. fine, it's fine. Um, <clears throat> so the, the language used by the, the two gentlemen really took my interest in that you spoke about community acceptance, uh, the need to reduce CO2 emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And this is my feeling, my personal opinion only, not those of my employer or anything like that. I feel we don't have that here in Australia. I feel the debate has been so completely bastardised and lacking in leadership that instead of bringing people along, it's put people, it's forced people into making a decision. You either believe or you don't. We accept the signs, we need to reduce CO2 emissions because what we do have consequences versus, no we don't, you're an idiot. In fact, I want to build more coal-fired power stations. My personal opinion. That being the case, it, vis-a-vis -vis we're seeing the retirement of 50% of our generation in by mid-230s, I think. Can we catch up, given that toxic environment we find ourselves in debate-wise? What, what can we learn each other in establishing a respectful and, and, and open dialogue? I'd, I'd ask participants to be relatively brief in responses. We have three more questions for seven minutes. So. so maybe I'll just jump in there. I, I don't think we actually have to have an adversarial debate anymore. And actually Falk made this point earlier. Um, at the moment, uh, we can actually combine a low emissions transition with also an affordable transition. That's, that's certainly 
everything that we see in our work, it, it's really just a function of speed. I'd certainly agree with that. I think we've, waste, we've wasted a lot of time um, debating whether to decarbonise and um, uh, instead of uh, getting on with the job of how, and it's been happening all around us anyway, despite all of this um, going on. So now I think we're playing a big game of catch up in terms of how. Faces again. Um, I'm actually from Hydromine. We are developing a uh, climate storage project and using old coal mines. So there's actually a future for coal, you know, in, uh, in doing that. Um, so I had a similar question to the gentleman over there, and uh, Frank actually stole my question in regards to the Coal Commission. And um, but anyway, I have a more specific question for Alex um, because I would like to understand what are, what are the biggest challenges that you are facing uh, during the ISP going forward, is it having enough storage capacity spe uh, specifically when we are thinking about having 200% renewables or is it more keeping the system stable and having the right logistics? So what are the biggest challenges there because some private storage could actually also provide a lot of the extra services and so on, so on the project uh, services that uh, currently the thermal uh, plants actually Thanks, Gabby. Great question. Um, let me give a flippant answer. I, I don't think there are actually any particular technical challenges around the ISP. I mean, it, look, it's hard work, it's difficult work, it's working under uh, uncertainty, it's using scenarios, it's thinking about how to balance the system from a reliability point of view, it, it is working out how to keep the system secure. But frankly, all of those technical challenges can be worked through, and I think we actually understand what to do. The, the, frankly, the biggest challenge is, is then moving from the plan, document, looks good, to actually making it happen in a timely fashion. And I think that's also what, um, what Anthea has been talking about. I mean, we have been talking about this for a long time. Now is the time to actually do something about it. Okay, very good. Um, we've got a comment in the... Oh, I'm sorry, Anita? Oh, Gunnar, yeah, briefly, okay. I was trying to not take... Do it. <laughs> we will finish up with a comment. I'm sorry, we yeah. will, uh, we've got the corner there and we will finish up with a comment by Ross Garno, the, the chair of, uh, of the Energy Transition Hub. Yeah, I keep it quick. Uh, Gunnar Luder from the Potsdam Institute. Uh, I have a question following up on the demand uh, discussion. Um, recognizing that 80% of our um, energy demand is non-electric in nature, uh, and we have all these opportunities on the electricity side, I wonder, shouldn't we push harder in electri electrifying these non-electric demands because it also would uh, improve efficiency? Is that something that you would discuss also on the, with regards to policy instruments uh, to get these electric or these uh, renewable electricity also into those sectors that currently rely heavily on, on fossil fuels? Um, to reduce emissions there as well. I can imagine that in Germany the uh, demand side uh, management potential will increase by electrifying the transport sector. Of course it will happen with uh, 40 million electric vehicles and we can charge them and we can use the batteries in these cars. It will increase the potential for demand side management. I'm a little bit more skeptical in Germany when we talk about producing hydrogen because it's uh, more efficient and cheaper if you do it all the time using these electrolyzers. Uh, and the problem is we will not have all the time 200% of renewable energy in the German system. So this will not, uh, not happen and it will not be used from my perspective mainly for uh, demand side management. Excuse my management of the, of the questions. I'm getting overwhelmed with too many. So Kath, Kath Rowley, <laughs> Kath Rowley Victoria. Um, in thinking about the energy transition, I'm interested in any quick thoughts on the role of climate resilience. Um, that uh, one of the things in thinking about future-proofing the energy system is not just the pathway to net zero, but also that it will be operating in a different climate. And I'm wondering, based on the work that you've done, whether you've identified that there are more synergies or more tensions, and whether or not it's important to keep those two things stitched together, or whether it's okay to just be 
focusing on the decarb part. Well, Alex. Kath, a uh, really important topic. Um, something, one of the many challenges that we're working sort of on the side on. Um, we, we are actually just starting to understand the, the interaction between the changes in the climate system and then the needs of the electricity system. And there's some, a lot of direct impacts. It's, it's changing demand patterns. It's changing inflow to hydro schemes. It's maybe increasing bushfire risks, which then affects transmission outages, et cetera. All of that we need to work in. We've actually just started a collaboration with the Bureau of Metrology to actually improve our understanding, first of all, of the available forecasts, and then we can work it in. But uh, there's probably there's much more that we need to do, frankly. Well, just to a quick thought. In, in Germany, I would say that this is an area where we can learn from Australia because uh, it, it's not a topic we think a lot about. Uh, there are no bushfires um, uh, and other things, but um, but it it is true it is true that we are now thinking about installing more and more air conditioners. For for example, it it was never a topic for Germany. It would heavily increase our power demand. Yeah. Um, so so there are thoughts about that, but but not on a systemic, general way. But maybe that's something we can learn from others. Quick corner from the uh, quick comment from the corner, Holly. Yeah. That's right. Hi, my name's Alex Leadington Cox. I'm a journalist from Australian Energy Daily. We'll keep it quick. Um, politically, there seems to be a lot of discussion about extending the life of these coal assets, doing anything that we can to keep them open. Um, but I would reference a report from uh, Aurora Energy Research for AEMO last year, which concluded that the early closure of one coal generator in the NEB. Uh, would reduce the risk of unplanned closures at the other plants because the economics would be shored up. Could we flip this concept around and just pay one of the coal generation, generators to shut down early to shore up the economics of the others and take some of the risk out? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a comment in response to a question by the media. So go right ahead. I don't think I should go into it. <laughs> but, but what I would say is that we've had one coal closure, which was Hazelwood, uh, which is surely have shored up the economics of the remaining, if, we would, if our current wholesale prices are anything to go by. OK. Well, well I, I, would, I would say the economics for coal-fired power plants will be worse and worse, no matter what you do. Uh, or on the other side, economics for renewables will be better and better. Um, so I'm not so sure if it's so easy, you close one and then the economics for the others work out. Um, there, there, will, there is a general challenge uh, for fossil uh, power plants in the future. And you can see that for, uh, again in the United States. Uh, since President Trump took office, 50 coal-fired power plants closed down um, just because of economic reasons. Um, and that shows you there is a trend. There is about 400 power plants, uh, coal-fired power plants in the in the U.S. 50 closed down. So you you see the economics drive them out of the market. Professor Roscano. And the hub hydrogen-related question for Anthony and slightly differently for Stefan and uh, Volk, but Anthony. Uh, uh, the minister mentioned that the um, lignite-based hydrogen uh, will be associated with carbon capture and storage. You, you didn't, but uh, is there any prospect uh, of uh, uh, um, brown hydrogen with, with carbon capture and storage being cheaper than green hydrogen? Uh, 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 have you done the numbers on that? And Stefan and Folk, you both said hydrogen's not going to be a uh, a, a big uh, production story in Germany itself. The future of primary iron making is a future through the use of hydrogen. It's, it seems to be emerging as the low cost uh, uh, route to uh, reduction of iron oxide. If you're not going to be doing that in Germany, Will Germany contemplate the sorts of structural change in the steel industry that would have that early stage zero emissions iron making done in Australia 
uh, with uh, a later stage processing in Germany. Um, so in terms of the relative cost of green versus brown hydrogen, um, brown hydrogen of course combined with CCS, um, I think there's so many uncertainties on both sides of that equation. Now, I think we're at such early days and part of the benefits of the um, project being undertaken in the Latrobe Valley now is to really get a better handle on what it actually entails and what it actually might cost. And so, um, and similarly, there's a huge amount of, you know, speculation on what, you know, future prices are, are going to be doing um, uh, on the green hydrogen side. So I think at this stage it's good to keep your options open, um, uh, which I think is what the Victorian government's currently doing. Green steel supply chains. Yeah, of course, we see a lot of discussion in Germany at the moment when we look at the steel sector, aluminium sector, also chemical industry to use hydrogen. Uh, we had a discussion about CCS in Germany 10 years ago. There is no public acceptance uh, for CCS in Germany and the legal situation is also very difficult after this discussion 10 years ago. But what is needed is a discussion about competitiveness of green steel compared to other regions in the world. Uh, and what we have at the moment is a discussion about border taxes in the European Union compared to Chinese steel, which is not green, or a discussion about subsidies. Both is not realistic, so I can imagine we, we need a, a broader debate about reducing taxes, fees, and levies on, on electricity to have more uh, green hydrogen in our system. So I'd like to say thank you for a wonderful discussion. Um, also to reiterate the appreciation to both federal governments for the financial and substantive support for, for the hub. Um, and uh, and, and to, to very heartily thank our panel.